Thank you very much, uh, Roman, for the introduction, and thanks to Siva for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk again about mycoplasma high pneumonia and to give a short overview of the disease and the research that has been done in the last years. And there have been many publications, many studies on mycoplasma high pneumonia in the last uh, years on different aspects. So I will only focus on the the major items as outlined by, uh, uh, by Roma. Short introduction, uh, uh, just to, to situate uh, the, patch uh, the pathogen, mycoplasma uh, is uh, a primary pathogen, meaning that it can um, cause disease, cause lesions without any other pathogen, without any other um, uh, toxic agent or uh, Um, yeah, so similar as the, the viruses uh, and also as far as soon, uh, uh, I always include that in the table because it may also cause respiratory disease. And apart from the primary, you also have the secondary pathogens, as you know, which may complicate another pathogen that causes first respiratory disease. How important is each pathogen, each disease in a specific country or a specific herd? And that's another question, and that's quite variable depending on many different uh, aspects. But anyway, and you have seen already the iceberg uh, photo. I think we took the same one, uh, Kim, from the internet. But anyway, I, I think it's a good image to illustrate that if we talk about clinical disease, we only have a minor part of the disease losses. Of course, we focus primarily on that, but we should realize that the losses to the pig industry are mainly caused by the subclinical infections, which we do not immediately uh, observe, of where we are not immediately aware of. Why are these subclinical infections most important from an economic point of view? Because most of the farms are subclinically infected, and even the clinically infected farms over time may evolve to a subclinical uh, infection. Because the second uh, reason is that we also know that uh, subclinical infections for mycoplasma hypermonia, but also for quite a lot of other uh, respiratory pathogens or pathogens, uh, may decrease performance growth up to 40 grams per day. And finally, specifically for mycoplasma high pneumonia, it's a door opener for many other respiratory pathogens, although clinical symptoms are not uh, obvious. Gerald Holtkamp from Iowa State University has uh, performed an interesting study aiming to assess the economic uh, losses, the economic importance of mycoplasma high pneumonia. And they uh, asked different big uh, swine producing companies uh, what their opinion was on the importance of um, swine diseases. And you can see here that actually out of that study it came that the three most important respiratory diseases were PERS, mycoplasma, and swine influenza. So mycoplasma actually was cited most uh, as the most important uh, disease in pigs. Here in the dots, the dark blue dots, uh, is also the score. Uh, apart from listing what are the most important pathogens, also they could indicate what is the severity, the importance of the disease. And you can see also that for these three pathogens, uh, the, they were considered as the most important. So a lowest score, number one, uh, was considered more important than two or three or a higher uh, score. In that same study, and they also uh, assessed the economic uh, importance and the financial uh, losses uh, of these three major pathogens, and they also assessed the combined uh, infection with PERS and MHIO. And they made the distinction between breeding, nursery, and finishers in uh, affected herds. And they assessed also the percentage of animals that were infected and then the losses for all pigs that are marketed. And for MHIO, we mainly look at the finishers, and you can see that the losses were more than $5 uh, per pig uh, marketed in affected uh, herds, which is, of course, a tremendous uh, loss and was also the highest, except for the combined uh, uh, infections. 
Um, here they indicated that approximately one third of the uh, pigs were uh, affected with these animals. And then you can see the total uh, losses uh, for all the animals uh, um, marketed. And then the total losses, um, breeding animals, nursery and finishers. In mycoplasma hyperammonia ended up with 2.58. Of course, PERS was much higher, in, which is mainly due to the impact, economic impact of PERS in the breeding population. What about the epidemiology? Well, a lot of studies have focused on um, assessing the prevalence at weaning and uh, try to find factors that may influence that prevalence uh, of, uh, we, uh, uh, of mycoplasma at weaning. Um, what we know already from studies years ago is that uh, maternal immunity uh, does not prevent colonization. It may decrease the infection and the infection level, but it does not prevent colonization. So piglets can become infected, colonized in the presence of maternal antibodies. Uh, several studies, recent studies also, have focused on risk factors for um, colonization at weaning or infection at weaning. And you see them listed here. Uh, farms which purchase more than 120 gilts per year. Uh, if there are many farrowing pens in the compartment, in the farrowing house. If a farm is not practicing batch farrowing. If we have a higher infection level of the farm, we have more chance that the piglets will be infected at weaning. If cross-fostering is uh, applied, and also if lactation uh, is longer, if the pigs stay for a longer time, longer period with the sows, which is uh, logical. However, if you look within a farm uh, and you uh, assess the prevalence at weaning, you can see that in some batches, the prevalence is, for instance, 20%, and in the next batch, it's only 5% or 3% or 15%. So it's quite variable within a farm between successive batches, especially in farms that practice uh, a more weak batch production uh, system. Why have so many studies focused on the prevalence of weaning uh, at weaning? Well, because some studies, mainly in multi-site uh, systems, uh, showed that the prevalence at weaning is predictive for pneumonia prevalence at slaughter or for respiratory disease during the fattening period. So if you have a high uh, prevalence at weaning, you can have more uh, disease later on uh, in these systems. We also performed uh, um, that, or tried to assess that association in single side farrow to finish pig herds, uh, four herds, uh, and we could not uh, find a significant association between prevalence at weaning and um, prevalence of lesions at slaughter or severity of lesions at slaughter. Likely because other factors may have determined also uh, the prevalence and severity of lung lesions at uh, slaughter. Anyway, in farms where we have already early infections, we have uh, shown that the vaccination results are better. Likely because in these farms you have a higher infection level, you have more damage by the disease, and there is more room for improvement by uh, vaccination. Very important in the epidemiology of mycoplasma hyperammonia is the fact that if pigs are infected with mycoplasma, they are infected for several weeks and several months. In contrast to many other diseases in pigs where the immune system is able to clear the infection after several weeks. So this is important for the epidemiology in the finisher stage. This is important for uh, the breeding population, uh, the quarantine unit, uh, the adaptation of breeding gills into farms, and so on. Transmission of mycoplasma high pneumonia uh, within herds. Well, we know that uh, direct contact uh, increases the likelihood of infection compared to indirect contact, but also picks in indirect contact, so in different pens compartments or even um, uh, stables uh, uh, can transmit the pathogen. It's even possible that between herds uh, located in the same neighborhood in that infection can move from one herd to another. 
the spread within a herd, at least in an endemic situation, is quite slow. This does not mean that if you have an infection in, in a free farm that you that quite a lot of animals may become infected in a short period of time. But in a stable situation, uh, usually this, the transmission is slow. Definitely if you compare it with uh, influenza viruses or other pathogens. Um, apart from when animals are infected or how many uh, animals are infected, it may also be interesting uh, to know uh, how many microorganisms uh, are present uh, in uh, the animals. And, uh, studies have shown that uh, actually the higher load in, in bowel fluid is higher in older animals than, for instance, in uh, nursery pigs. Prevalence, time of uh, infection, uh, infection load. Uh, another aspect of the epidemiology is the diversity of strains. Mycoplasma hypermonia is a very diverse pathogen, similar to other mycoplasmas in pigs and to other pathogens in, in pigs. Uh, um, but if you look at the uh, genetic level, uh, if you uh, use MLVA uh, to uh, assess diversity, uh, you can see that there is quite some variation between the strains um, of different farms. Here you see the results of the diversity in three different strains. Uh, we collected bowel fluid uh, at 10, 15, and 20 weeks, and then also went to the slaughterhouse uh, uh, when pigs of these farms were slaughtered, and we repeated the slaughter visits uh, one and three months later. And in the bowel fluid, we uh, assessed whether mycoplasma was present and also the diversity. And here, arrows in the same color mean that every time the same mycoplasma strain uh, was found. If you see arrows with different colors, it means that different strains were present. And in that first farm, actually only one strain was found, consistently found over time. Whereas here in farm two and three, different strains were found. Here, that was a, a farm that was closed. No animals were, ha, had been purchased in, in the last years. Whereas here, these were farms where the breeding guilds were purchased. Likely, and more strains entered the farm uh, via the uh, breeding uh, guilds. Okay, but it shows, at least, that within the same farm, you can have quite different uh, strains. This is a graphical uh, representation, so I will not uh, elaborate on that. What does it mean, is the next question, all that diversity? It's interesting to show that uh, in farms you have different strains, or, uh, but what, what, what is the clinical impact? What should we do with that? Uh, well, we performed the study in 10 uh, farms, and because most of the farms in Belgium are vaccinated, uh, we uh, selected vaccinated herds and investigated three batches of slaughter pigs within each uh, herd. And we collected 20 bowel fluids from each batch, and we also assessed the lung lesions of these different batches. We uh, assessed the samples with nested PCR, and of the positive ones, we performed MLVA. Uh, we found that 83% of the samples were positive, and that in total, we found 135 different strains, which is, of course, uh, a large number. In 102 lungs, we found two different strains, and in six lungs, we even found three uh, different strains. Uh, so this confirmed, actually, uh, the previous research. And in the six, in, uh, next step, eh, we also uh, tried to find an association between the number of uh, different strains that were circulating in a batch, on the one hand, and the uh, lung lesions, the severity of the lung lesions, on the other hand. And we corrected for other pathogens and also for non-infectious factors, hurt factors, that of course may also influence the severity uh, of uh, the lesions. And we uh, could show that uh, in addition to these other factors, that uh, batches where more different strains were circulating, that there were more severe lung lesions. Uh, this does not show that um, one particular strain may cause more disease, but this shows that if you have more heterogeneity or more variation in the strain circulating in a group of pigs, you can have more disease, more lesions. 
Pathogenesis, also quite a lot of studies that have focused on that. And just the basics again, MHIO adheres to the ciliated epithelial cells of the trachea, the bronchi, and the larger bronchioles. And then uh, it causes clumping of the cilia, ciliostasis, and also loss of cilia, of course, interfering with the defense of the animal. Uh, from a histopathological point of view, you see an infiltration of lymphohistiocytic cells in that may um, uh, obstruct in the lumen of the respiratory tract. The adhesion process is multifactorial. It's not only one uh, adhesion molecule, in but different molecules that may be involved. Mostly proteins, but also lipoproteins or other uh, factors may be involved. In addition to that, eh, mycoplasma hyper pneumonia is, uh, uh, has quite a lot of surface proteins, eh, but is also uh, able to uh, perform proteolytic processing. And that means that if mycoplasma hyper pneumonia is in the respiratory tract, different molecules at the surface of MHIO, of, of, of mycoplasma, uh, uh, are cleaved into different uh, proteins. Eh, or peptides, and uh, these may have different functions. Some of them, they serve as adhesins, whereas others, and they uh, may act as proteases. So they may interact with uh, plasminogen and plasmin, and in, in this way, actually interfere with the normal function histology of the respiratory tract. And likely also this mechanism is responsible for the fact that in some animals, at least shown under experimental conditions, MHIO does not remain in the respiratory tract locally, but may be found in internal organs like the kidney, the liver, and the spleen, and can be isolated from some of these organs. Uh, also, the group of uh, Stephen Georgievich has worked a lot of, of, on this uh, aspect. Uh, uh, and they showed that uh, MHIO is also able to form biofilms. Mm -hmm. The role or the importance uh, under practical conditions uh, remains to be investigated. But anyway, a lot of research here, uh, and actually the research did not really come up with a clear solution, but actually illustrated that MHIO uh, possesses a lot of mechanisms to adhere, multiply, and damage the, the animal host, so uh, it has not m m made the solution easier to, to, let us say, to block or to stop the mycoplasma uh, interaction with the animal host. So the adhesion and all these processes that takes place for every mycoplasma hyper pneumonia, but we know that some strains are capable to induce more lesions, more uh, severe uh, uh, disease. Why are some strains then more virulent than others? Well, the virulent factors are largely unknown. We know that adherence and colonization efficacy may play a role, although some studies could not confirm that. We know that MHIO may modulate immunity, and maybe some strains are more efficient to do that. One study already many years ago showed that uh, uh, maybe some toxic substance or peroxide uh, products may uh, be released by some uh, strains. Some strains are also capable to induce more cytokines than others. So actually, at this stage, there is no virulence marker available uh, for uh, mycoplasma hyperpneumonia. The outcome of the disease can thus be determined by the virulence of the strain. Okay? Um, by, of course, the farm conditions, if you look uh, at, at field con uh, under field conditions. Eh? But some studies, and it's also our experience, eh, that possibly that it may also be some breed effect, eh? that some uh, breeds, some lines uh, of uh, pigs may be more susceptible to infection, uh, disease, lesion uh, development. So uh, um, quite some interesting recent studies have uh, being performed in that uh, area. I think I can be short about uh, the interactions of uh, mycoplasma hyper pneumonia with uh, other pathogens. Nevertheless, very important, in, but these are studies that have been conducted uh, already quite some years ago, showing actually that mycoplasma hyper pneumonia is a primary pathogen and may increase the severity of other respiratory pathogens. Viruses, PERS, PCV2, swine influenza, bacteria, Pasteurella multicida, 
actinobacillus pleura pneumonia, and also if you have combined infection uh, with Ascaris zoom larvae and mycoplasma hypermonia, you have more lesions. And you can also see that not all uh, studies are uh, showing consistent results. Yeah? So it may depend on factors of study design, strain, and so on, why variation in outcome may be obtained. Apart from the interaction with other infectious pathogens, eh, also some studies have focused on the interaction with mycotoxins. You know that in uh, our uh, big farms in, in Europe, and actually worldwide, eh, very often the, the feed is contaminated with mycotoxins. And we, we know that these products are not very good for the animals. They may affect the health, the immune system, and so on. So uh, some studies uh, assessed whether there was a negative effect of uh, um, this mycotoxin contamination in the feed on the one hand and mycoplasma uh, disease on the other hand. Here with fumonizin, uh, um, they could show that actually pigs that consume contaminated feed and that they develop more severe disease. It was not pronounced, uh, but in a few animals there was uh, an interaction. We did the same with, or uh, similar study with uh, uh, DOM, uh, deoxyvalinol uh, mycotoxin, uh, which is very common in, in European uh, pig feed. Uh, and you, you know that uh, according to EU legislation, the maximum level uh, is 900 uh, microgram. We um, provided 1,800, so double the dose. And we could not show that um, pigs that consumed that feed uh, had more severe uh, lesions, unfortunately. It does not mean that there is no interaction in the field conditions, because we provided that mycotoxin only for a limited period of time, only that mycotoxin, whereas in, in the field we know that very often more uh, mycotoxins are present in the, in the feed at the same time, so maybe there is an interaction uh, under field conditions. So considerations uh, with these uh, dual infections. In general, more severe disease uh, in case of dual uh, infections, uh, but quite some variation. Uh, maybe related to the, the strain of the, the pathogen, infection dose, infection time, infection route, uh, whether conventional or colostrum-deprived cesarean-derived picks were used, uh, because it's easier to induce disease or lesions in these picks. Uh, also, other factors uh, may be uh, involved in the variation in results. Diagnosis, uh, I think I can be short in that because it has been um, um, presented uh, by Paul in the first presentation. Uh, um, however, there are quite some studies that have uh, used different sampling techniques uh, and used different diagnostic tests to better assess the infection level uh, in a farm. And in general, uh, uh, if you take the sample uh, in the place where mycoplasma hypermonia multiply, the trachea, the bronchi, uh, if you sample there, bulk fluid or swabs, uh, you have the highest, highest uh, chance to detect uh, the pathogen, especially if you use nested PCR or UPCR. Oral fluids uh, have also been investigated uh, recently in some studies here in, uh, in Spain in the group of, uh, of uh, Kim and, and Marina, and also in, uh, uh, in Minnesota. And we also performed a, a study or, or sampled some, uh, some pens, uh, and actually uh, low sensitivity and no consistent results. So for MHIO, it appears that oral fluids are not really uh, the most suitable diagnostic uh, uh, sample, especially if no clinical symptoms are present. If you have high infection levels, likely, then you will detect it, but not for, for monitor, monitoring. Anyway, if we um, think of diagnostics in terms of we try, we, we, we have to assess the importance of mycoplasma in a clinical problem, it's up to the herd veterinarian to combine all the information from blood sampling, PCR testing, necropsy, slaughterhouse information, clinical symptoms, performance losses, and all these uh, things. Treatment uh, and control. Uh, you know that mycoplasma hyperammonia has no um, cell wall, uh, meaning that beta-lactam antibiotics 
cannot be used, at least not for MHIO. Maybe they can be used for the secondary pathogens. Yeah? And also sulfonamides and primetoprim are not um, um, active against MHIO. But again, they may have an effect on the secondary pathogen. Here are the antibiotics that are most commonly uh, used for MHIO. Um, acquired resistance has been shown for uh, these antibiotics. And if you look over time, in the last two decades, there may be a slight increase in the resistance levels or a decrease in the sensitivity levels of the strains. But uh, actually, at this stage, uh, antimicrobial resistance for MHIO is not yet a problem uh, for clinical uh, treatment of uh, the infection. It may be a problem for the, the secondary pathogens, but at this stage, not yet for MHIO. We vaccinate a lot uh, against uh, mycoplasma hypermonia, and we mostly use bacterins, eh, and sometimes uh, vaccines with soluble antigens. And most of the vaccines have an adjuvant, which is considered to be important for stimulating the immune response. We know that the vaccines are uh, efficient to reduce clinical symptoms, lesions, performance losses, and also to reduce the number, the infection load in the lungs. But we also know uh, that they have a limited reduction in the transmission. So with vaccination alone, we will not uh, come to a point where we can eliminate the infection from pig herds. We can decrease the number of infected animals, but we will not eliminate uh, uh, MHIO from the pig herd. So no sterile uh, immunity. Different vaccination strategies have been used. I think uh, all of you know that. Uh, currently, we mostly apply one-shot uh, vaccines. In the past, it was more double vaccination. We mostly vaccinate the piglets um, at weaning or before weaning or sometimes shortly after weaning, mostly intramuscularly, but also intradermal vaccination is possible. We also vaccinate the gills uh, when they are purchased or in, in, in the breeding uh, farm. Uh, so in some farms, uh, vaccination of the sows during gestation or group vaccination of the sows is uh, implemented, in, but this is less common. And we can you, uh, combine MHIO vaccination with vaccination against other pathogens. Here you see uh, the results of a study uh, in which we compared vaccination at weaning compared to three, vaccination three days before weaning. And here you see the results vaccinating three days before weaning, here at weaning, uh, and this was a positive control. Experimental conditions. Um, the rationale behind was that actually most of many farms vaccinate at weaning uh, because of the practical uh, considerations. But on the other hand, we also know it's not good to vaccinate animals when they are stressed. Well, weaning is one of the most stressful events in the life of a pig. So that was the reason to see is that really uh, affecting the efficacy of the vaccination or not. And here you see that the results in terms of lung lesions, microscopic uh, and uh, gross lesions, uh, and also the, the density of the lung tissue and uh, the immunofluorescence, to, which is a, a, an indication for the number of MHIO organisms present in the lung tissues. Uh, slight differences, but slightly better for the pigs that were vaccinated three days before weaning compared to vaccinating at weaning. We have done the same, but then under field conditions. Uh, here, the V1 is, again, the group that was vaccinated before weaning, and the V2, the, vaccinating, the vaccine uh, at weaning. And also here, you can see quite small differences, but again, consistently better okay, for the groups that were vaccinated a few days uh, before weaning, okay? likely because they have less problems with the stress uh, of weaning at the moment that the antigen is presented to the immune system. We also have performed uh, a study in which we compared vaccination at weaning compared to vaccination at one week of age. Um, and actually, we had selected a farm with a rather 
with rather early uh, infections, so infection in the nursery. So we uh, assessed this sampling before the start of the study. And then when we started, it appeared that uh, in our groups, no infection occurred in the nursery, but only later on at 161 days. Uh, so quite late infection. And you can see that the infection was not only with MHIO, but also with uh, other viral respiratory pathogens. And you can see uh, that uh, the results uh, vaccinating at one week or at weaning is quite variable for some parameters, vaccination at one week was better, and for the other parameter, vaccinating at three weeks was better, and the differences were quite small. But anyway, better than the control group, but no differences between the two uh, vaccination groups um, in that particular farm under these conditions. We have uh, also performed an experimental study with the vaccine Hyogen uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, we vaccinate, the pigs were weaned at 28 days, they were vaccinated at 33 days, then challenged uh, on two successive uh, days eh, with a high and a low virulent strain, uh, and then necropsy was performed four weeks later. And you can see that the vaccinated group was uh, uh, at a very good results, a, a major reduction in lung lesions, eh? we were quite surprised uh, with that. Eh? So here you had the positive control group and here the vaccinated uh, group, and this was the, the negative control group. Uh, and you can see that also in our challenge model, 100% uh, of the pigs developed actually pneumonia lesions, but even under these conditions, uh, the vaccine was able to uh, significantly reduce the uh, lung lesion to pneumonia lesions. Also quite uh, a good serological response in the vaccinated uh, groups, uh, three quarter of the pigs um, seroconverted already three, uh, three weeks after uh, vaccination. In terms of clinical symptoms, coughing, uh, significant reduction. Uh, here that was a positive control group, uh, coughing index, and here that was the vaccinated group. You see still there is some coughing, uh, but quite some reduction. In terms of number of mycoplasma organisms in the, in the lung, tissue or in the bowel fluid, and you'll see also a significant uh, reduction in that, and also in terms of histopathological lesions. Actually, uh, yeah, quite good results under these experimental uh, conditions with uh, the hydrogen vaccine. So mostly vaccination in piglets, eh? vaccination in uh, sows, eh? in the quarantine unit. In Belgium, it's very common, eh? almost all pig sow gilts, not all, but much by far the majority of the, the animals are vaccinated in, in the quarantine unit or before, depending on the situation. Eh? Um, and it's mainly done if the infection state of the gilts is not known or if the gilts are free from the infection and come into an endemically infected farm. Eh? The vaccination has two major aims. Eh? On the one hand, to uh, avoid destabilization of the breeding stock uh, immunity so that there is no shedding of mycoplasma uh, higher pneumonia in the breeding population and also to the, to the piglets. Eh? And on the other hand, also to confirm uh, immunity to the cholesterol immunity to the piglets. We have uh, performed uh, a study with sow vaccination at the end of gestation to see whether we can uh, improve or decrease the infection level at weaning and also improve the lung lesions the, uh, at uh, the slaughter age. We have done that in two herds, herd A and herd B. Herd A, we found 20% uh, positives uh, at weaning, whereas in herd B, you see that we uh, only found a very low number of infected animals at weaning. So actually here that farm was not appropriate to to uh, uh, yeah, to, to answer our question because we had insufficient positive uh, animals. But here in that farm, it was uh, possible, and you can see that there was a significant reduction in the percentage of positive pigs at weaning uh, if the pigs came from vaccinated cells compared to non-vaccinated cells. Oral fluids, uh, we also detected some uh, positives, and also here we found uh, some differences, but 
because of lack of statistical power and there was no uh, significant uh, difference. Of course, it's interesting to see the prevalence at weaning, but in the end, it may also be interesting to look, does the effect um, uh, remain until slaughter age? And you can see here that uh, in HERT A, and that and the severity of the lesions and also the prevalence of the pneumonia lesions was significantly lower in the pigs that originated from the sows that were uh, vaccinated. Of course, here in HERT um, B, it was not, uh, we did not uh, find uh, a difference. So here, the, the information is that, well, sow vaccination may uh, uh, help it to additionally improve uh, the uh, infection level of mycoplasma high pneumonia and in some farms also the pneumonia lesions uh, at, uh, at slaughter. Question, do we have to vaccinate or not? Uh, well, I would say if you have clinical disease, yes. If uh, the farm is free, no. Okay, but of course, the majority of the farms are somewhere in between. If you have a moderate infection level, I would say yes, also vaccinate because we know that you have economic loss. If you have a very low infection level, well, it's, uh, it, it has to be decided case by case and to see how important MHIO is. And in some farms, it may not be economically justified to vaccinate. In other farms, it may uh, be justified. The last uh, slide uh, here uh, about the experimental vaccines. There are many studies uh, conducted in the last 10, 15 years uh, on different vaccines um, because the current vaccines are economically justified in the majority of the farms. They are efficient and so on, but uh, they are not able to, let us say, uh, significantly reduce transmission in order to achieve elimination. So that's the reason why uh, many research groups uh, are trying to find uh, new uh, and even better uh, vaccines. Sepionid vac vaccines, DNA vaccines, attenuated vaccines, different administration routes, intramuscular, intranasal, intradermal, vaccines in the feet, vaccines, especially in China, directly in the thorax, eh, at the acupuncture uh, place after the scapula, um, so, uh, also aerosol, uh, aerosol vaccines, uh, different adjuvants, studies in pigs and in mice. Actually, to assess efficacy, we need to work in pigs. Uh, studies have focused only on immunological parameters. Others also looked at efficacy. But to summarize, actually, all these vaccines uh, were not able to provide better results than the currently available commercial uh, vaccines. So further optimization and validation is definitely uh, necessary. Conclusion, MHIO is still a key pathogen in PRDC. It's a complex interaction with the animal. Also, the epidemiology is complex, mainly because of the persistent in infection. Eh? More diversity of strains in a batch leads to more severe uh, disease and lung lesions. Eh? MHIO may increase the infection with other pathogens. For treatment, we have some uh, antibiotic resistance, but at this stage, it's not yet a problem. The beta-lactam antibiotics are not active against MHIO, but may be active against the secondary pathogens. Vaccination reduces the disease losses and is cost-efficient in many pig herds. Uh, Hygiene vaccine is very efficacious in experimental conditions, uh, and the development of experimental vaccines is ongoing, in, but so far in the commercial vaccines do their job and show um, similar or even better uh, efficacy than the, the experimental vaccines uh, so far. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to take any questions.